Okay, we are now starting. And everybody can say hi. But quietly because it's nap time, right? All right. You want to hold that for me? Thank you. All right, my name, oh, let's just try this. This is The Horse and His Boy, uh, <coughs> Chapter 3, At the Gates of Tashba'an. My name, said the girl at once, is Aravis Tarkina, and I am the only daughter of Kidrash Tarkan, the son of Arashti Tarkan, the son of Kidrash Tarkan, the son of Ilsombrech Tisrok, the son of Ardib Tisrok, who is descended in the right line from the god Tash. My father is the lord of the province of Kalvar and is one who has the right of standing on his feet in his shoes before the face of Tisrok himself. May he live forever. My mother, on whom be the peace of the gods, is dead, and my father has married another wife. One of my brothers has fallen in battle against the rebels in the far west, and the other is a child. Now it came to pass that my father's wife and my stepmother hated me, and the sun appeared dark in her eyes as long as I lived in my father's house. And so she persuaded my father to promise me in marriage to Ashtoka Tarkan. Now this Ashtoka is of base birth, though in these latter years he has won favor from the Tisrock, may he live forever, by flattery and evil counsels, and is now made a Tarkan and the lord of many cities, and is likely to be chosen as the Grand Vizier when the present Grand Vizier dies. Moreover, he is at least sixty years old and has a bump on his back, and his face resembles that of an ape. So that means he's ugly, right? He's an ugly old man. Nevertheless, my father, because of the wealth and the power of this Ashtoka, has been persuaded by his wife, sent messengers offering me in marriage, and the offer was favorably accepted by Ashtoka, and that sent word that he would marry me this very year at the high time of summer. So she doesn't want to get married to this guy, I bet. When this news was brought to me, and the sun appeared dark in my eyes, and I laid myself on my bed and wept for a day, but on the second day I rose up, washed my face, and caused my mare Wynn to be saddled, and took with me a sharp dagger which my brother had carried to the western wars, and rode out alone. And when my father's house was out of sight, and I was come to a green open place in, certain, in a certain wood where there were no dwellings of men, I dismounted from Wynn, my mare, took out the dagger, and then I parted my clothes where I thought the readiest way lay to my heart, and I prayed to all the gods that as soon as I was dead, I might find myself with my brother. And after that, I shut my eyes and my teeth and prepared to drive the dagger into my heart. Scary, huh? But before I had done so, this mare spoke with the voice of one of the daughters of men and said, Oh, my mistress, do not by any means destroy yourself. For if you live, you may yet have good fortune, but, but all the dead are dead alike. I didn't say it half so well as that, muttered the mare. Hush, ma'am, hush, said Bree, who was thoroughly enjoying the story. She's telling it in the grand Calormini manner, and no storyteller in the Tisrock's court could do it better. Pray go on, Tartina. When I heard the language of men uttered by my mare, continued Erebus, I said to myself, The fear of death has disordered my reason and subjected me to delusions. And I became full of shame, for none of my lineage ought to fear death more than the biting of a gnat. Therefore I addressed myself a second time to the stabbing, but Wynne came near to me and put her head between me and the dagger and asked to me most excellent reasons and rebuked me as a mother rebukes her daughter. And now my wonder was so great that I forgot about killing myself and, and about Ashtoka, and I said, O oh my mirror, how have you learned to speak like one of the daughters of men? And Wynn told me that it is known to all this company that in Narnia there are beasts that talk, and how she herself was stolen from thence when she was but a little foal. She told me also of the woods and waters of Narnia and the castles and the great ships, till I said, In the name of Tash and Azeroth and Zardina, Lady of the Night, I have a great wish to be in the country of Narnia. O oh, my mistress, answered the mirror, if you were in Narnia, you would be happy, for in that land no maiden is forced to marry against her will. And when we had talked together for a great time, hope returned to me, and I rejoiced that I had not killed myself. Moreover, it was agreed between Wynne and me that we should steal ourselves away together, and we planned it in this fashion. 
we returned to my father's house and I put on my gayest clothes and sang and danced before my father and pretended to be delighted with the marriage which he had prepared for me. Also, I said to him, O my father, and O the delight of my eyes, give me your license and permission to go with one of my maidens alone for three days into the woods to do secret sacrifices to Sardina, lady of the night and of maidens, as is proper and customary for damsels when they must bid farewell to the services of Sardina and prepare themselves for marriage. <coughs> and he answered, O my daughter, and O the delight of my eyes, so shall it be. When I came out from the presence of my father, I went immediately to the oldest of his slaves, his secretary, who had dandled me on his knee when I was a baby and loved me more than the air and the light. And I, and I sworn him to be secret and begged him to write a certain letter for me. And he wept and implored me to change my resolution. But in the end, he said, to hear is to obey. And he did all of my will. And I sealed the letter and I hid it in my bosom. But what was in the letter, asked Shasta. Be quiet, youngster, said Bree. You're spoiling the story. You'll tell us all about the letter in the right place. Go on, Tarquina. Then I called the maid, who was to go with me to the woods and perform the rites of Zardina, and told her to wake me very early in the morning. And I became merry with her and gave her wine to drink. But I had mixed such things in her cup that I knew she must sleep for a night and a day. And as soon as the household of my father had committed themselves to sleep, I arose and I put on my armor, I put on an armor of my brothers, which I always kept in my chamber. In his memory, I put into my girdle all the money I had and certain choice jewels and provided myself also with food and saddled the mare with my own hands and rode away in the second watch of the night. I directed my course <coughs> not to the woods where my father supposed that I would go, but north and east to Tashba'an. Now for three days more I knew that my father would not seek me, being deceived by the words I had said to him. And on the fourth day we arrived in the city of Azim Balda. Now Azim Balda stands at the meeting of many roads, and from it the posts of the Tisroch, may he live forever, ride on swift horses to every part of the empire, and it is one of the rights and privileges of the greater Tarkans to send messages by them. I therefore went to the city of the chief of the messengers in the house of imperial posts, in al Balda and said, O dispatcher of messages, here is a letter from my uncle Ashtoka Tarkan to Kidrash Tarkan, the lord of Kalvar. Take now these five crescents and cause it to be sent to him. And the chief of the messenger said, To hear is to obey. This letter was feigned to be written by Ashtoka, and this was the signification of the writing. Ashtoka Tarkan to Kidrash Tarkan, salutation and peace. In the name of Tash the Irresistible, the Inexorable, be it known to you that I was made my that I that as I made my journey toward your house to perform the contract of marriage between me and your daughter Erebus Tarkina, it pleased fortune and the gods that I fell in with her in the forest when she had ended the rites and sacrifices of Zardina according to the custom of maidens. And when I learned who she was, being delighted with her beauty and discretion, I became inflamed with love, and it appeared to me that the sun would be dark to me if I did not marry her at once. Accordingly, I prepared the necessary sacrifices and married your daughter the same hour that I met her and have returned with her to my own house. And we both pray and charge you to come hither as speedily as you may, that we may be <coughs> delighted with your face and speech and also that you may bring with you the dowry of my wife, which by reason of my great charges and expenses I require without delay. And because thou and I are brothers, I assure myself that you will not be angered by the haste of my marriage, which is wholly occasioned by the great love I bear for your daughter, and I commit you to the care of all the gods. Now, did the Tarkina lie and send a letter to Eshtoka? Yeah. Why do you think? Um, I have a, I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. Okay, you'll find out in a second. What do you think? I think that um, Tarkina was, um, jealous, and she, so she did, that she, that, her, um, <coughs> grandpa didn't give her the letter she wanted, so oh, she yeah. broke the letter and gave it back to him. It's a sneaky trick. We'll, we'll read on later, we'll figure it out. As soon as I had done this, I rode in all haste from Azim Balda, fearing no pursuit and expecting that my father, having received such a letter, would send messages to Ashtoka 
or go to him himself, and that before the matter was discovered, I should be beyond Tashba'an. And that is the path of my story until this very night when I was chased by lions and met you at the swimming of the salt water. And what happened to the girl, the one you drugged, asked Shasta? Doubtless she was beaten for sleeping late, said Aravis coolly, but she was a tool and a spy of my stepmother's. I am very glad they should beat her. So is Tarquina nice? No. Not really. <laughs> so no. she lied to her father, and then she lied <coughs> to her the guy she was supposed to get married to in order to get some time to get away, is what she did. Okay, I say, that's hardly fair, said Shasta. I did not do any of these things for the sake of pleasing you, said Erebus. And there's another thing I don't understand about that story, said Shasta. You're not grown up. I don't believe you're any older than I am. I don't believe you are as old. How could you be getting married at your age? Erebus said nothing, but Bree at once said, Shasta, don't display your ignorance. They're always married at that age in the great Tarkin families. Shasta turned very red, but it was hardly light enough for the others to see this, and felt snubbed. Erebus asked Bree for his story. Bree told it, and Shasta thought that he put on a good deal more than he needed to about the falls and the bad writing. Bree obviously thought it was very funny, but Erebus did not laugh. When Bree had finished, they all went to sleep. The next day, all four of them, two horses and two humans, continued to journey together. Shasta thought it had been much pleasanter when he and Bree were on their own. For now, it was Bree and Erebus who did nearly all the talking. Bree had lived a long time in Kalanin and had <coughs> always been among the Tarkins and Tarkins' horses, and so, of course, he knew a great many of the same people and places that Erebus did. She would always be saying things like, But if you were in the fight of Zeludre, you would have seen my cousin Ali Mash. And Bree would answer, Oh yes, Ali Mash, he was the only captain of the chariots, you know. I don't quite hold with chariots or the kind of horses who draw chariots. That's not real cavalry, but he was a worthy nobleman. He filled my nose bag with sugar after talking of Tabith. Or else Bree would say, I was down at the lake of Mizreel that summer, and Erebus would say, Oh, Mizreel, I had friends there. Lazaroline, Tarkina, what a delightful place it is. Those gardens and the Valley of the Thousand Perfumes. Bree was not in the least trying to leave Shasta out of things, though Shasta sometimes nearly thought he was. People who know a lot of the same things can hardly help talking about them, and if you're there, you can hardly help feeling that you're out of it. When the mare was rather shy before a great war horse like Bree and said very little, and Erebus never spoke to Shasta at all if she could not help it. <coughs> Soon, however, they had more important things to think of. They were getting near to Tashba'an. There were more and larger villages and more people on the roads, and now, now did nearly all of their traveling by night and hid as best they could during the day. And at every halt they argued and argued about what they would do when they reached Tashba'an. Everyone had been putting off this difficulty, but now it would be put off no longer. During these discussions, Erebus became a little, a very little less unfriendly to Shasta. One usually gets on better with people when one is making plans and when one is talking about <coughs> nothing in particular. Bree said the first thing now was to, they had to do was to fix a place where they would all promise to meet on the far side of Tashba'an, even if by ill luck, you know what ill luck is? Bad luck. Bad luck. Even if by ill luck they got separated passing through the city. He said that the best place would be the tombs of the ancient kings on the very edge of the desert. It's like a, uh, it's like a, a cemetery, <coughs> but they're big, huge structures for kings. Like big, huge stones? No, they're big, huge cemetery stones. Is it like, is it like... Have you ever been to a cemetery? I have. Mm -hmm. I do have a question. What's that? Is it like when, is that like what they're talking about? Like whenever someone or something dies, they bury it right there? Yep. <coughs> and they create on the top of where they bury them a tomb. A big structure to memorialize their death. Oh, I just broke a thing. Well, what, what if there's like... And so, these things are like great stone beehives, he said. You can't possibly miss them, and the best of it is that none of the Keller minis will go near them because they think the place is haunted by ghouls and they are afraid of it. Erebus asked if it wasn't really haunted by ghouls, but Bree said he was a free Narnian horse and didn't believe in these Calormini tales. And when Shasta said he wasn't a Calormini either and didn't care a straw about those old stories of ghouls, that wasn't quite true, but it rather impressed Erebus. 
though at the moment it annoyed her too, and of course she said she didn't mind the number of mules either, so it was settled that the tombs should be their assembly place on the other side of Tashba'an, and everybody felt they were getting on very well till Huin humbly pointed out that the real problem was not where they should go, was not where they should go when they had got through Tashba'an, but how they were going to get through it. Okay? So, that's a pretty big problem. We'll settle that tomorrow, ma'am, said Bree. Time for a little sleep now. But it wasn't easy to settle. Erebus' first suggestion was that they should swim across the river below the city during the night and not go into Tashba'an at all. But Bree had two reasons against this. One was that the river mouth was very wide and it would be far too long a swim for Wynne to do, especially with the rider on her back. He thought it would be too long for himself too, but he said much less about that. The other was that it would be full of shipping, and of course anyone on the deck of the ship who saw two horses swimming past would almost certain to be inquisitive, which means curious. Shasta thought they should go up the river above Tashban and cross it where it was narrower. But Bree explained that there were gardens and pleasure houses on both banks of the river for miles, and that there would be Tarkans and Tarkinas living in them and riding along the roads and having water parties on the river. In fact, it would be the most likely place in the world for meeting someone who would recognize Aramis or even himself. We'll have to have a disguise, said Shasta. Wynne said it looked to her as if the safest thing to do was to go right through the city itself from gate to gate because one was less likely to be noticed in the crowd. But she approved of the idea of disguise as well. You know what a disguise is? It's when you make yourself look like not you. So we would take you and we'd take charcoal and cover your whole face and make it look black. Then you wouldn't look like you anymore, would you? That would be a disguise, right? Yeah, or like if you were like that. Pretend Ellie was wearing like a princess dress. That's it. And what do you got to say? What, what do you have to say? Um, if you had a bunch of costumes or disguises, then you could go on like if like if they were going into a the town with a disguise, then they could take off their disguise and be disguised from their disguise, so nobody knows. And then they c and then if they catch them, then they can go into another disguise. And then that's really yeah. tricky. It's tricky, isn't it? Yeah, it's cool. That's actually good. Anyway, I think that's cool. Anyway, uh, let's see what else we were. Oh yeah, Wynne said it looked to her like the safest thing was to go right through the city, and that they ought to wear a disguise. Both the humans will have to dress in rags, right? Somebody said that, and look like peasants or slaves. And all Erebus's armor and our saddles and things must be made into bundles and put on our backs. And the children must pretend to drive us, and people will think we're only pack horses. Okay? My dear Wynne, said Erebus rather scornfully, as if anyone could mistake Bree for anything but a war horse, however you disguised him. I should think not, indeed, said Bree, snorting and letting his ears go ever so slightly back. I know it's not a very good idea, said Wynne, but I think it's our only chance. And we haven't been groomed for ages, and we're not looking quite ourselves, at least I'm sure I'm not. I do think if we get well plastered with mud and go along with our heads down as if we're tired and lazy, and don't lift our hooves hardly at all, we might not be noticed, and our tails ought to be cut shorter, not neatly, you know, but all raggedy. My dear madam, said Bree, have you picked yourself how very disagreeable it would be to arrive in Narnia in that condition? Well, said Wynne humbly, for she was a very sensible horse, the main thing is to get there. Although nobody much liked it, it was Wynne's plan which had to be adapted to in the end. It was, trouble it was a troublesome one and involved a certain amount of what Shasta called stealing and Bree called raiding. One farm lost a few sacks that evening and another lost a coil of rope the next, but... Some tattered old boys' clothes for Erebus to wear had to be fairly bought and paid for in a village. Shasta returned with them in triumph, just as evening was closing in. The others were waiting for him along the trees at the foot of a low range of wooded hills which lay right across their path. Everyone was feeling excited because this was the last hill. When they reached the ridge at the top, they would be looking down on Tashba'an. I do wish we were safely past it, muttered Shasta to Wynne. Oh, I do, I do, said Wynne fervently. 
That night, wound their way, they wound their way through the woods up to the ridge by a woodcutter's track, and then they came out of the woods. At the top, they could see a thousands of lights in the valley below them. Shasta had had no notion of what a great city would be like, and it frightened him. They had their supper, and, and the children got some sleep, but the horses woke them very early the next morning. The stars were still out, and the grass was terribly cold and wet, but daybreak was just beginning. Far to the right across the sea, Erebus went a few steps away into the wood and came back looking odd in her new ragged clothes and carrying her real ones in a bundle. These and her armor and her shield and her scimitar and the two saddles and the rest of the horse's fine furnishings were put into the sacks. Bree and Wynn had already got themselves dirty and bedraggled and they, as they could and it remained to shorten their tails. As the only tool for doing this was Erebus' scimitar, one of the packs had to be undone again in order to get it out. It was the longest job and rather hurt the horses. My word, said Bree, if I wasn't a talking horse, what a lovely kick in the face I would give you. I thought you were going to cut it, not pull it out, but that's what it feels like. But in spite of a semi-darkness and cold fingers, all was done in the end. The big packs bound on the horses and rope halters, which they were now wearing instead of bridles and reins, in the children's hands, and the journey began. Remember, said Bree, keep together if we possibly can. If not, meet at the tombs, right? <coughs> ancient kings, and whoever gets there first must wait for the others. And remember, said Shasta, don't you two horses forget yourselves and start talking whatever happens. And that is the end of that chapter, chapter at the gates of Tashba'an. Okay, can you shut that off, Grandma? Okay, bye. 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 bye.